Monster Professor. Welcome to the Monster Professor, a show in which we discuss and explore monsters in literature, myth, film, games, folklore, culture, and beyond. I'm your host, Josh Woods, author, editor, professor, and monster expert, and I hope your month of Halloween is going well. Today's episode is about serial killers, but not modern serial killers as so many of us, including myself, think of them. We're going all the way back to Greek mythology, serial killers in Greek myth, and in Roman myth and in Roman history as well, so serial killers in the classical world, but we spend a lot of our time focused on those monsters and killers in Greek myth that would count as serial killers. Now, who in the world would want to talk to me about serial killers in Greek myth? Well, the very person who wrote the book on it, Dr. Debbie Felton. Uh, her book is Monsters and Monarchs, Serial Killers in Classical Myth and History, but that's just one of her many projects. She's also editor of A Cultural History of Fairy Tales in Antiquity. Right now, she's working on the Oxford Handbook of Monsters and classical myth. Uh, she's been editor of the journal Preternature, Nature, Critical and Historical Studies in the Preternatural. Uh, also the uh, associate review editor of a journal of the fantastic in the arts for many years. Um, and right now she's up at UMass as a classics professor. She's actually been there since 1999, having graduated from UCLA and uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She's a really fun scholar to get to talk to about a really fascinating subject. So here we go. Thank you so much for joining me here on The Monster Professor, Dr. Debbie Felton. Oh, Josh, thanks for having me. Um, you've, you've, uh, have some impressive expertise in the world of not only classics, <laughs> but in the darker side of the classics in, in Greek mythology and Roman mythology. Um, and it's an intriguing one. One and one of your specializations in particular, I hope we can jump into today because you've you've you dig into witches in the classical world and you dig into ghosts in the classical world, very much so the monsters of the classical world. But you also have an interesting approach of looking for serial killers in Greek and Roman mythology. And I really want to pick your brain on that because I'm, I'm, I think I'm clueless about it, but I've got lots of questions for you about it. <laughs> and so maybe you can give us a tour of it. Um, but perhaps before we do, we should find out a little bit about you. Like what in the world led you from moving your classical studies into the darker side of the classics, such as monsters, ghosts, and serial killers? Oh, gosh. Oh, well, that, that's a good question. And it's funny because I've never thought of it as the darker side. Um, so that's that's a neat way of putting it, I suppose. It's not like I'm like a, a depressed person who's heavily into the <laughs> occult or anything. But I um, I was always interested in ghost stories. And I, I guess I sort of thank my dad for that. When I was growing up, he, he liked horror stories and ghost stories. And we tended to have a lot of anthologies of those stories uh, just at home. So I'd be reading through those. And, and uh over the years, I just started noticing that there were similar stories from classical antiquity. But in terms of the serial killers, um, I mean, I grew up in Los Angeles of the 60s and 70s. And so unfortunately, uh, there was quite a lot in the news, uh, you know, of very disturbing spree killings, uh, serial killings, that sort of thing. So the, the Manson uh, family, the Manson family murders were one of the first things that I remember hearing about in, in the 60s. And, uh, you know, and then there were there were the, the Hillside Strangler uh, murders and up north there was there were the Zodiac killings. So I, I kind of felt like my childhood was weirdly, you know, steeped in in uh, in that kind of environment because um, it was all very sensationalistic. Uh, not, not that serial killers are, you know, all over the place. I mean, they're not ubiquitous. It's actually serial killing is really rare. I mean, like fewer than one percent of murders are 
done by serial killers, but they get so much attention um, because there's such a ritualistic aspect to a lot of them. And uh, it, it often takes so long to realize that you have a serial killer and to then to catch the serial killer. And sometimes they're never caught. I mean, they never did figure out who Zodiac was. Yeah. Wow. Um, and so, and, and somehow you started seeing connection there in classical mythology and then <laughs> you started seeing these killers in classical mythology. Yeah. I, um, you know, I don't know why it took me so long actually now that I th think of it because, um, I, I don't know, for some reason, I, I don't know if there had just been a recent serial killer story in the news at, at the point when I started this, but I started wondering, um, whether there were serial killer stories from the ancient world. And then I, I realized, and I wasn't necessarily the only one either, but, um, I think I'm, was the first one to put it all, you know, put a, put a lot of it together, but there are characters that sound very much like serial killers. I, I you know, like the myth of Theseus, for example, Example, where he meets all of these roadside criminals like Procrustes. Um, so Procrustes would lure travelers uh, into his house, offer them a bed for the night, and then uh, when they were there, when they were there, he would uh, make sure that they fit the bed properly. So if their limbs were too long, he would saw them off, or uh, if their limbs were too short, he would hammer them out until they fit the bed. And of course, they would die from this sort of torture and mutilation. And it just kind of occurred to me, well, that kind of sounds like a serial killer. He's got his murder kit with the saw or axe or hammer or whatever, and he seems perfectly friendly and that it, friendly enough that people are willing to take him up on the offer of a bed for the night on their on the long road uh, that they were traveling on. And, and then I started looking at other ones and they were just, yeah, there were these patterns that uh, I think we tend to associate with serial killers. Although I, I do need to, to, to say right up front that I have zero background in criminology or psychology and that we certainly don't have forensic evidence from 2000 and 3000 years ago. So this is all just sort of not to say that, they, that these characters definitely were serial killers so much as to say that the Greeks and Romans were able to describe killings like what we now would think of as serial killings. Yeah, that's a that's a good way to explain it. I do. I definitely want to come back to those those six uh, <laughs> those six villains that he went through in his gauntlet. But um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, this you know, I at least and and I think some others get this sense that well, serial killing is a is like a, a modern phenomenon or, or or a dark modern art form uh, i don't know if i should say that but i guess in, in some way it is um like the, you know the writer chuck klosterman in his essay this is zodiac speaking you know calls it uh, what does he say serial killing is a glam killing and, and it has this as this uh, this appeal to it that I think, well, mm -hmm. how many TV shows are dedicated to serial killers? A whole entire networks now are basically <laughs> one serial killer documentary after another. And so it's really strange to think of it in the ancient world, but you explain it well, how if what we're looking for is a type of pattern and a, t a pattern of behavior, then we can find that elsewhere, even in the in the classic world. So, so I'm wondering if you know you you say you're not a criminology expert, but I know you have some knowledge on this. So I'm I'm kind of curious, like what what kind of patterns are we looking for when we look for serial killers? All I know is. I think the FBI recently revised their definition to say, if you kill two or more people over the course of time, you're into serial murder or something like that. But it's, yeah. is there anything else we're uh, looking for? <laughs> well, that's, you know, it's, I'm glad you brought up the FBI's revision of their, their criteria uh, because the criteria for, you know, are we dealing with a serial killer is constantly changing and being updated because it's so amorphous in some ways. It's like it used to be, well, it had to be three or more people and they had to be killed in different places, uh, you know, over a period of time. But, oh, but the Zodiac's first murder was like two people. So does that count as one or two? You know, uh, so they're constantly shifting, like, how should we think of this? And the more they interview known serial killers and the more they find out, the more they can try to uh, finesse their, their definitions. But there are, there are several different things that 
you know, I, I suppose we can look for. And one of those is, is there any background about how these people grew up or like their behavior when they were younger? And the other is, well, do they, you know, kill two or more people over a period of time by the same method? You know, is there a sort of a ritualistic aspect to it? And were they able to conceal their crimes for a long time before somebody caught up with them? And that's one of the odd things about Procrustes. It's like, well, clearly people knew about him, but nobody uh, did anything. And, and uh, the people who would uh, fall prey to Procrustes clearly did not know about him, at least, you know, in the myths. Uh, so they would be foreigners. They wouldn't know the local area and they didn't know that there was this danger lurking by the side of the road. So uh, a lot of the very general patterns that we might think of as being associated with serial killers are present in the ancient world, including at least a couple of instances where we do have some background of how they uh, were when they were younger, how, you know, what their behavior was like when they were younger. Uh, so I found those per particularly interesting, but I do, I do want to say uh, regarding, um, you know, as, as you mentioned, there are so many shows about serial killers. I can't emphasize enough that it's still such a very rare phenomenon. Uh, and, but if you watch a show like Criminal Minds, it's like there, there's a serial killer every other week, you know, yeah. from, before that show went off the air. It's like, no. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. And well, you were you were bringing up this uh, this point that a big part of it is can they conceal the murders or can they can they hide the murders? And I think that is interesting aspect, too, because I think that kind of takes us back to. You know this the old scandinavian distinction between killing and murder like killing happened all the time if you killed someone yeah. unjustly you had to either pay the family what they were worth or what they brought in or they got to come after you and if you tried to avoid that by mm -hmm. hiding the body now that was murder <laughs> and so maybe that's <laughs> the beginning of our yeah. our distinctions on looking for serial killers but by the same methods almost ritualistically i think is a is a good distinction too, because that one makes sense. And I think that fits. So, well, for, for a lot of our listeners, um, who are, who are trying to jog their memory, like, wait, okay, which one was Theseus? So Theseus, you, you'll probably remember most famously for the Athenian hero who, who volunteers as tribute, goes off to Crete, to go into the labyrinth and fight the Minotaur and finds his way out with, with the clue or the string the Ariadne gives him. But before all that, uh, he leaves his, his place of birth after having a sword in the stone moment, I guess sword and sandals <laughs> under a stone. Sandals, yeah, <laughs> fighting the sandals under the rock, yeah. Yeah, and I guess, I don't know if that was that signify like his 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 destiny to be a warrior, but also his, his traveling that he has uh, yeah. to do with the sandals. And then he goes through, I don't know, I call it a gauntlet because it seems like a, a tough rite of passage where he takes a long way by foot uh, around the peninsula to, I mean, around the, uh, the sea to Athens. But I, I guess the, the, I guess the proper way to say it is his six labors, uh, you know, compared to Hercules 12. I don't know. So maybe we could run through though. I think you, in, I think you mentioned the most interesting already Procrustes, the guy who said bed <laughs> stretches or, or bed cuts you. Um, but the first two, I'm curious if you think either one of those are serial killers. So the, the first one is like a club guy. He beats people with clubs, right? And then the second yeah. one is sinus. Is it? Do I, I I like pronouncing it sinus because I'm pretty sure that's wrong. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so maybe <laughs> uh, tell us about uh, them. Sinus even. or sinus? Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> okay, tell us about them and whether you think either one of those two are serial killers. Well, I tend, first of all, I agree with you about calling it a gauntlet, actually, because it's sort of like he has to prove himself before he gets to Athens. Uh, and he like intentionally takes this road instead of just hopping on a boat and going across the Gulf there to Athens. So it's sort of he wants to have adventures um, and he kind of knows it's a dangerous road and he wants to prove himself. But I would, you know, honestly, I, I think all six of these villains that he comes across have serial killer aspects to them. And so you're talking about um, Periphides, the club bearer, the one who would kill people with the club. Um, he is, as you said, the Periphides is the first villain that 
Theseus comes across. And um, he was interesting because he he was he had a deformity. He sort of walked with a limp and sort of used the club as his walking stick, but then would also use it to cave in the skulls of anyone who passed by. Um, supposedly, all of these six villains were basically highway robbers. But what struck me, and this is what one of the reasons I started looking into them a little more, is that none of the stories focus on the actual robbing part. Like, so they don't say, oh yeah, and Periphetes took the, the money or, and here's what he did with the money. It's always, and here's how he killed people. <laughs> so they're sort of generically labeled as robbers, um, but that aspect of the story isn't the focus at all. It's how they kill people. So Periphetes, just anybody who passed by his part of the road, he would bash their heads in. The stories don't really say what he did with the bodies or again, why nobody noticed people disappearing in that area, other than to say that it was a very, you know, it was a deserted stretch of road and quite possibly larger groups of people went by unharmed, but these six villains tended to target lone travelers, you know, just traveling with a back, you know, a knapsack or something. And so Theseus, uh, whenever he would come across one of these people like Periphetes, he would fight him and he would uh, end up killing the villain by the villain's own methods. So in this case, Theseus gets the club away from Periphetes and bashes his skull in with it. Um, so it's it's a little disturbing the extent to which Theseus is sort of lauded for doing the same thing that the uh, actual villains were doing. <laughs> And uh, certainly, you know, you can ask, well, that does not make Theseus the serial killer. Um, there are some distinctions that the Greeks made about that in terms of Theseus atoning for bloodshed and that his motives were different. Uh, and, you know, he wasn't wailing people by the side of the road. He was trying to get rid of these criminals. There was no police force in antiquity, in mythological times or even historical times. Uh, so it would be sort of vigilantes like this. And like you had mentioned with the uh, the Scandinavian uh, sort of blood feuding, like if, if somebody killed one of your family members, you could then bring them within your rights to go and kill that person. So that that kind of an interchange of, of revenge killing was sort of okay under certain circumstances, uh, I think is what, we, what we've got some remnants of here. Oh, and then you'd asked about um, Sinus also. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the pine guy. The pine bender. <laughs> so that was the second villain or criminal that Theseus came across on his road from southern Greece around the Gulf uh, to get to the city of Athens. And uh, Sinus or Sinus uh, was a fun, well, I don't want to say a fun one exactly, but his method of killing was so interesting. It uh, is a fun thing. one. It's a fun one to even act oh. out in class. Too. <laughs> oh, so. God. And there's some great, uh, there's some great pictures in Greek vase painting. There's actually some illustrations um not not uh well the illustrations are usually of theseus uh getting vengeance on the killer rather than what the killer is actually doing but there are definitely some some illustrations on greek you know greek vase paintings from the fifth century bce that that show these these criminals um so sinus or sinus was known for again waylaying travelers and there are variants of the story as there are often are with greek myths so in in some versions uh sinus would would tie people okay so I guess he'd rob them again not that that's ever mentioned but then he would tie them between two trees and then uh then let go and so they'd be torn in half or in some versions of the story he would just tie them to one tree and then let go of the branch and they would be flung up you know into the air and onto the ground on the other side or just they would just end up flying through the air and dying when they hit the ground um so, uh, so Theseus comes along and does the same thing to, to him. And, uh, but so what we're seeing with Periphetes and, 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 and Sinus, for example, are these, uh, this very, very specific and unique methods of killing, or at least Sinus is, is, is unique. Um, Periphetes just bashes people over the head of his club, but it's the same method that they use on, on everybody that they manage to lure into their home or uh, catch passing through their territory. Uh, so killing a number of people over a period of time uh, with a particular method is, again, a sort of very generic, you know, general definition of uh, what you see in a lot of serial killings, I guess.
Yeah, and, and even if that method is rather Looney Tunish, I think as it is with Sinus the <laughs> Pine Bender, because that is just yeah. I can't I can't help but I mean I might be an evil or cold hearted person, but I, I'm sure <laughs> I'm not the only one who finds that hilarious thing <laughs> watching somebody get it's flung through. It's really pine strange. Tree. <laughs> it yeah. is. No, it's it's completely strange. And you know, if you start to think about these it, like it literally, it's like, well, how is this guy gonna manage to bend down a pine tree and tie some? I mean, how he can, anyway, he, you know, did he have some device to do this or what? So, so taking it apart on a literal level is is not super helpful because most of these myths should not be taken literally in any in any sense. Um, but uh, these uh, these criminals, like Theseus himself, tended to have at least one deity in their ancestry, like Poseidon was their father and a mortal mother or that kind of thing. So they they did have a bit of superhuman strength in some respects uh, that at least if you really needed to rationalize, could they actually bend over a pine tree and do this? <laughs> you could, you know, you could rationalize it. But I think I think that's sort of beside the point. And then they're like, well, why pine trees? And the area that that Sinus was uh, was in mythologically was known for the, its abundance of pine trees, you know, around the southern isthmus of Corinth. Uh, so, you know, that's evidently, uh, you know, inspired somebody's imagination. Uh, but yeah, to come up with the the mutilation murder of tying somebody to two trees and letting them go and be torn in half is, well, uh, that's uh, that's some warped imagination there, yeah. Yeah, then, and it hadn't occurred to me, you know, I had always pictured him as, as some form of giant that would just grab the trees and pull them down. I think I might have just made that up, though. But, you know, it didn't occur to me until you're describing it now that it does, it does sound like it matches up with some of those bushcraft traps that you make for small game, as well, in yeah. bending down a sapling and having the having the loop or, of the rope or the or whatever cordage you have down there where the the victim steps in and then it they're essentially flung up and caught yeah. in the air and very often are killed in that and so i guess you could make it man-sized i don't know it <laughs> makes me wonder <laughs> yeah no i think you're absolutely right about that it, it it may well just have to do with a certain type of trapping that people would do for you you know animals um and you're just loop you know getting caught around the one of the legs and being uh flung up into the air and uh, if the flinging doesn't kill you, then, you know, when somebody come, when the hunter comes along and cuts you down, you know, you're going to be killed. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. And, you know, you're pointing out that although they were supposed to be highway robbers, the stories are just about the murders, not the robbers. Yes. And, you yeah. know, you wouldn't in the city, you wouldn't get away with killing people on a whim too often before you're finally lynched or, or uh, someone gets you. And so if, you know, we did have those people, and certainly we did have human beings who just liked killing strangers, uh, then in the ancient world, you might get away with it for a while if you go out of the city out into the wilderness. And so I guess there's no other way to make a living other than taking, if all you want to do is kill people, maybe robbing was secondary for them. Maybe they really were serial killers out there that kind of spawned these perhaps exaggerated stories. Yeah, it, it certainly seems possible, if if not likely. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, I sort of lost my train of thought. But uh, I, oh, I know what I was going to say. It was about the roads. I mean, highway killings are still like one of the one of the main places where serial killers. Uh, are at work is is along roads. I mean, they, you know, you, you, they pick up hitchhikers or they're truckers who pick up prostitutes and then the prostitutes disappear. And so the FBI at some point um, actually initiated, and, and I, I think this is a very bad name for it, The it was something like the the Highway Killers Initiative or something, <laughs> as if you were going to start it and that, that it would be a good thing to get going, when really what it meant was, you know, they're, they're forming this task force to try to stop all of these highway killings, uh, the, the, these anonymous killings on the highways, because the roads are one of the easiest places to get away with it. Um, if you're driving, you know, cross country or something. Uh, and uh, yeah, so, so it's interesting that, I mean, it makes sense that this was the sort of, like, if there were serial killers in the ancient world, that they would work the highways, just as people, you know, still, still do. Yeah, and, that, and um, those 
You know, and you already brought up the question that started appearing in my mind, too. It's like, well, doesn't that make Theseus a serial killer, too? But you're right. He doesn't. He is more of a vigilante in that sense. It's not killing people by the same methods uh, for his own entertainment. He really is kind of clearing. Well, the Theseus, the arranger, the organizer is kind of sorting out the wilderness into a, a civilized area, so to speak. And so and he gets through. You know, a, a few more, you, you already mentioned Procrustes, the, the sixth mm -hmm. one, but uh, the next three are, are even more baffling to me, I think, than the <laughs> first two. So you've, oh, got, yes. you've got the, the third, uh, this, who is either a sow or a crone. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> which one it is, and I could never sort that out. Then you've got a guy who makes people wash his feet, and then he kicks yep. them, and I'm really confused at that. And then a good old wrestler, I think, number <laughs> five. Um, so could yeah. you help sort those out for us or, or perhaps just sort them out for me and make some sense? Okay, it. sure. So, yeah. So the next one after Sinus is, is called Faya. And again, because there are multiple versions of so many Greek myths, it's, in some of the stories, Faya is an, an old woman who has raised a man-eating pig. Uh, and in other stories, Faya is just this giant, you know, wild pig that's out of control and that that that, that kills people. So so the, the episode is known as the like the Chromionian sow, because Chromion is the region where Theseus you know encountered this creature and or its owner. And so this was like some huge and ferocious pig that would kill people indiscriminately. And if it was the pig itself, you know, I'm a little hesitant to say, okay, it's a serial killing pig. It's just pigs do kill and eat people. I mean, they will if, if you give them a chance. Uh, but if we take the versions where the pig is under the control of this old woman, uh, it's interesting because then it gives us uh, one of the rare examples of a female killer uh, who is directing this animal uh, because she's too old and decrepit herself directing this this ferocious animal that she raised and for some reason can control uh, to kill people you know again to rob them but this is a particularly gruesome way to have them disposed of but one of the uh, one of the things that came to mind when I was you know was rethinking about this story was um uh, did you ever see that movie Lake Placid? Yeah, yeah. With uh, with Betty, <laughs> turns on the spoiler alert on some like twenty or thirty year old movie, <laughs> but uh, Betty White turns out to be the one controlling this. What is it? A gigantic uh, 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 crocodile yeah, gator, or alligator? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, so she's basically been having this crocodile kill people. And I just thought, oh my God, I'm wondering if the person behind that movie like had ever read the story of, of, of Theseus and Faya, for example. And so Theseus, again, depending on the uh, depending on the version of the story, he either kills the pig or he kills the old woman or both uh, and solves that problem so people can now travel through that area in safety. Yeah, I'd never put that together, but I think you're exactly right. Whether <laughs> whether those uh, screenwriters or filmmakers knew that or not, somewhere in their minds <laughs> was <laughs> was the classical impulse, I guess. <laughs> it's just it's just too funny. I mean, the the old woman, you know, in charge of uh, raising a man eating you know creature. Um, so the so what's up with the uh, Skiron or however he yeah. pronounce his name with the foot yeah again thing. Skiron or Skyron, um, so this is uh, you know Theseus just is again traveling around the Gulf uh, through the Isthmus of Corinth on his way to Athens. The next villain he meets is called Skiron or Skyron. And uh, this one, this is another very, very odd one, sort of like, well, they're all a bit odd in their own way, but sort of like the pine bender. This is, this is unique. Um, so uh, again, supposedly robs them, but, but that, again, not the main point of the story. Um, after robbing them, assuming that he does that, he would shove uh, the travelers to the ground and then force them to wash his feet. And he even had a little bowl nearby, you know, that he with water and it ready for this purpose. And then while his victims were crouching on the ground, he would kick them over the cliff into the sea. And uh, that's not the end of it, because apparently at the bottom of the cliff, there is a, a man-eating turtle. <laughs> that if the fall on the rocks didn't kill them, then the turtle did. And it's just, you know, like, what? <laughs> So I didn't know this. I didn't know this turtle part at all. I don't. How did oh, I miss yeah. this? Oh yeah, and at least 
at least one version has a crab instead of a turtle. Um, so, so yes, there's there's a giant sea turtle uh, in most versions of the story, uh, so that if the fall didn't kill the travelers, then the, the turtle did. And Theseus got rid of uh, Skyrim the same way by throwing him over the cliff into the jaws of the waiting turtle. Uh, so again, just like, what? Okay, so, so there's an animal in this one, sort of like, uh, you know, with a Chromionian sow, uh, the, the giant ferocious pig, but uh, the turtle doesn't have to be there. I mean, generally people will die if you kick them over a cliff onto the rocks and into the ocean, but yeah. this turtle is in there and still haven't quite sorted out why there's, why it's in the story at all, other than the uh, tendency to acknowledge man-eating animals, uh, which occur, you know, not infrequently in Greek myth, because there are also some like man-eating horses in one, in one other myth. Uh, and, yeah, and so it's just uh, another one of those details that you're like, how did that get into the story? Um, so anyway, it's uh, so Skyron is another very odd character. And there's, you know, we can speculate that like with Procrustes in the bed, that is, is there some sort of, you know, homoerotic or, you know, sexual impulse at the base of this if he's having them crouch over and wash his feet like what is that about that's a kind of subservience it's like sort of maybe what we might call a power control serial killer um forcing someone into a humiliating position before uh killing them torturing them and killing them yeah yeah i, I mean i guess you're you're right in pointing out that you know in that one well that one at least with skiron uh it, it would it, it takes kind of a uh what a, a hospitable kind of gesture or or something that's at least a little bit kind of like um I don't know domestic as in washing your feet something not uh, purely of the wilderness and then turning it into something evil or dark but but Procrustes you have some that hospitable nature kind of flipped upside down into evil torture and murder as well but as you point yeah. out with Procrustes it would take a traveler to trust him and unlike all the others who could have just who could just waylay you and and overpower you Procrustes does seem to be one who lures you in which is yeah. which is an odd thing and and before him we get a king who just wants to wrestle for to the <laughs> death is that I mean yeah. is, is this pro wrestling and WWE <laughs> yeah um I mean not so much pro wrestling but this this particular episode with Theseus I mean a lot of Theseus's adventures were modeled after the adventures of Heracles uh, or Hercules uh, to the Romans and Heracles was uh, you know a, a much more broad like pan-Hellenic like all over Greece sort of hero and the Athenian were trying to make Theseus into more of an Athenian hero. And Theseus was, was Heracles' younger cousin. And Heracles had similar sort of adventures. These are not as famous as his 12 labors, but Heracles also would, would travel the roads and come across these, these antagonists who would insist on uh, fighting you or killing you in some odd way. Uh, not as odd as, as most of the examples in the Theseus story. But in the case of Kerkion, the king who would force people to wrestle with him, he, he would torture and murder anyone who refused to wrestle with him. And he would, up until Theseus anyway, always win the forced wrestling contest. And uh, Heracles had also had to wrestle uh, uh, one of uh, one of the villains that he came across, Antaeus. So that particular episode uh, may be more closely related to or modeled after uh, Theseus's older cousin. But yes, it was just like, you know, you have to wrestle me or I'm going to kill you. But if you wrestle me, I'm going to kill you. So either way, you decide. Um, yeah. And uh it's uh, again a sort of a power struggle, like the um, Kerkion, this this king who forced people to wrestle, was just trying. There's more of an overt like power control issue there that you find in in some serial killings. Yeah, and, and re wrestlers can be some vicious people, I think, through and through. Maybe maybe we're only one step away from from serial killers ourselves. Like I think last night I nearly got killed wrestling some <laughs> some dangerous <laughs> wrestlers as well i'm glad i've made it long enough to get to this podcast this morning um we've got a whole we got a range of of weird psychos that Theseus goes through for sure and they do sound like i mean by that rational definition of serial killing they do sound like serial killers to me and so I think you I think you're convincing me that we have serial killers in the classical world. <laughs> um, there I I hear now I haven't I haven't read your your explanation of this, 
And so I have to know, I, I read somewhere that you uh, even think of perhaps the Sphinx as a kind of serial killer. And that absolutely fascinates me. Are you, are you okay with jumping there? And <laughs> sure. Um, and I, you know, I, I think um, there are a couple of things I would, I, I could say about that, but I have to sort of backtrack a little bit to explain that uh, um, John Douglas, who uh, used to work for the FBI and wrote the book Mindhunter. And now there's, um, is it a Netflix series? They've had a couple of seasons based on that. You know, again, this, the series is called Mindhunter. So John Douglas um, of the FBI wrote a book talking about his experiences. But one of the things he said that I thought was so interesting was that, well, what about, you know, early modern Europe? I mean, you know, he was noted, noting himself that serial killing, killing most likely was not just a modern phenomenon. And he was speculating that, well, in early modern Europe, what about these stories of werewolves and vampires and other creatures that killed people on a regular basis? And I mean, okay, so so werewolves, you could sort of say, well, yes, there were wolf packs, you know, in the forests of early modern Europe, and there still are. So, you know, clearly some people were in fact killed by wolves. But yeah. uh, if you're talking about like the, the bodies of people being mutilated and murdered in a certain way and, and in town, you know, or on the roads where people can find them, or you're talking about some odd vampiric activity while people are being drained of their blood. Uh, the idea that John Douglas was, was uh, throwing out there was, well, maybe these stories are sort of based on real life serial killings, but people just didn't want to think that fellow humans could do anything that horrible. And so they turned them into, into legends. And so as far as a creature like the Sphinx goes, I don't really think that the Sphinx was modeled after, you know, any sort of serial killer mentality that might have been, you know, thought of in antiquity. But I think it's interesting to notice that unlike a lot of the other monsters from the ancient world, the Sphinx has a, a, um, a preferred victim type and a preferred method of killing. So this is just an example of how you can speculate. So the Sphinx, uh, her victims were young men. Um, and uh, she apparently strangled them, again, depending on what version of the story you're looking at. Um, and so she and she was also like basically wailing them by the road as they tried to come in or come in or go out of the city of Thebes. Uh, so it's, it's not so much that I think that the Sphinx was a serial killer or was modeled after a serial killer. I just found the elements interesting compared to other monsters, uh, particularly in some of the rationalization stories that you also had in antiquity. Oh, the Sphinx, there couldn't, there couldn't really have been a monster like that, like all hybrid parts, it's just not physically naturally possible. So maybe the Sphinx was a female bandit who would come out of her lair and kill uh, young men and therefore was more like a serial killer. So it's just, uh, it's just sort of a fun kind of spec speculation of, well, look at these elements that we can tease out of some of these stories, even with something like the, the, the Theban Sphinx. Even before the Sphinx was attached to the Oedipus and Thebes story, Sphinxes in Greece were associated with the deaths of young men, particularly, for reasons that I, I'm not sure are entirely clear uh, yet. Yeah, they had, they had, didn't they have images of, of the mm -hmm. Sphinx on the, the tombs of anyone who died, who happened to die young and be male, right? I mean, and yeah, and not even just on tombs, but there would be, um, oh, I think I saw an engraving on a gemstone that was of a Sphinx like lying on top of a young man. Um, and there are pictures, uh, I think there's some Greek vase paintings again, you know, from 2,500 years ago, showing the Sphinx attacking young men. Um, so it's always a certain type, like for some reason it's young men, you, you don't see the Sphinx attacking old bearded, you know, characters. Um, so it's, yeah, it's really interesting. Like what was the connection that they were making there? Um, and is it sort of a like, are we dealing with some sort of, you know, relation to in incubi and succubi uh, that's going on there in people's minds? So there's just so many directions you can go in with, with some of these stories. And it's just really fun to sort of, like I said, tease out certain elements and think, oh, well, you know, um, along with the rationalizations that were going on even in antiquity. So like over 2000 years ago, there were Greeks who were saying, oh, come on, there's no such thing as a sphinx. It's got to have been like some female robber. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> anyway. And she, and she, uh, in the Oedipus story, you know, she would hit her victims with a riddle first. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't, although I don't know 
Now, you might know of any serial killers who forced their victims through riddles, but we at least had the Zodiac killer who played right. with very sphinx-like riddles with the with law enforcement. Yeah, with the, with codes. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, and and it's uh, the Zodiac is probably the most well known who would send these cryptic, you know, literally, you know, code messages in code to uh, the police and to journalists. But that aspect of riddling does does show up in uh, some. Uh, some serial kill- some serial killing stories in, in the Zodiac is, is I think the best known one. I'm trying to like there were a couple of others and for some reason I can't quite remember them off the top of my head. But the riddling aspect is a very interesting one, and it's it's in some ways it's also related to a whole other type of of related story, which is um, uh, princesses who uh, need to be married off or don't want to be married off, but uh, their fathers want them to be or don't want them to be. And so you pose riddles to their suitors. And if the suitors can't solve the riddle, then they they forfeit their lives. And only the suitor who solves the riddle uh, wins the the hand of the princess. And that's a sort of a a worldwide folktale, actually, um, but does suggest, wait a minute, you know, are we going to consider these kings serial killers because this is what they're doing? Or the princesses themselves, whose idea it was uh, to to pose a riddle. And I think, gosh, don't you even see that in the opera Turandot, now that I think of it? Um, Anyway. Uh, so, so that's, there's this whole like, you know, riddle telling to, you know, save your life or solve riddle solving to, to save your life that shows up in some similar circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, I guess that, you know, the Sphinx, well, you know, Oedip- the, the story goes of the general impression of the story goes that, you know, and Oedipus is the one who solves the riddle and then the Sphinx has to kill herself or does <laughs> yeah. kill herself. Oh, and he off. does, he wins the princess, right? I mean, he wins the queen. He he does get to marry Jocasta. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, but yes. And then the in, in most versions, the Sphinx, as you said, kills herself by throwing herself off the cliff, which always seemed to be a weird way for a creature with wings to kill herself. But in at least one version, Oedipus does kill the Sphinx himself with a sword. And that puts him into the uh, like monsters, like the dragon slayer, the monster slayer sort of hero type instead of just the riddle solver type. Yeah. And, you know, the and in that at that moment where he encounters the Sphinx, like like all of those other associations, he again is a, is a young man. Um, but but rather than the Sphinx getting other young men, you know, he overcomes the Sphinx until you zoom out and you look at his story and you go, oh, wait, that's <laughs> that moment he encountered the Sphinx was the true end of his life and in a kind of fated way as you as you just mentioned well because he kills the sphinx he gets to marry the queen uh, who has been widowed because the king had just been killed not too long ago and then he must find out oh no i killed the king who was my father i've just married my mother oh no yeah it's a it's an interesting story. I just have to warn you, my cats are getting restless for some reason. It's not even close oh. to their lunchtime, but they are starting to like, like knock papers off the table. And things. <laughs> so if you hear background noise, one of them is sitting here staring at me and the other one is on the table, like, like, like pushing papers off of it. So let, let me know if the background noise gets to be uh, too much and I'll see if I can distract them with a snack or something i think it's because they know we're talking about the sphinx and that's one of their ancestors and maybe they're (laughs) maybe we're not showing enough uh i don't know honor to the sphinx and that's that's the hero in their mind oedipus (laughs) was the villain of course and and the sphinx well you know it's 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 interesting that you mentioned that because um you know again in the uh and the Theseus story, for example, when we were talking about, well, couldn't he be considered a serial killer? The thing is, from the point of view of those local places, like Eleusis, I think, was Kirkion, if I'm uh, remembering right. So, in fact, I can sort of quickly check. But, uh, you know, Theseus was representative of Athens. And this uh, this Kirkion character, the one who wrestled people, 
was king of uh, Eleusis, a uh, sort of a neighboring town. And Athens and Eleusis were antagonistic towards each other. So of course, Athens has Theseus like, you know, killing the king of Eleusis and having that king be some horrible, you know, serial killer like criminal. But from the point of view of Eleusis, Theseus absolutely was the antagonist uh, who attacked, you know, unfairly unprovoked and, and all of this and was just looking for trouble. So, um, so yes, the uh, point of view of my cats in terms of uh, thinking that we are not having enough respect for the things is completely valid. <laughs> yeah, and and you know that we since we brought up Hercules already or Heracles, uh, and we're think we're flipping the perspective. I mean, just like we we could question that about Theseus, does he fit the the profile of the serial killer? I think you laid out a good case that he doesn't really. Um, and well, and I have he, to wonder um, if Hercules does too. I mean, he goes around <laughs> and kills a bunch of poor monsters minding their own business, so to speak. <laughs> Well, yeah, Heracles is called. So two things. First of all, with, with Theseus, um, he does atone, like he, he formally atones for having shed blood. Um, and he is purified by the inhabitants of a uh, a town um, on, on near, near Athens. So um, so he at least shows remorse, which none of the criminals did. Um, and Heracles, though, uh, if you're talking about his 12 labors, uh, as uh, you know, he was assigned to those to atone for killing his family in a fit of madness that was brought on by the envious goddess Hera. So he was told to go out and kill these creatures. Um, the hope being, as is often the case in his hero stories, the hope being that he would be killed by one of them and not be successful. Uh, so you're always, you know, assigning these heroes impossible seeming tasks uh, in order to try to get rid of them. So that, you know, like you'll have a usurping king uh, trying to hold on to his throne by sending the real heir off on some impossible quest, like getting the golden fleece or something like that. Um, and the case of Heracles, the, uh, the cousin who was assigning the 12 labors kept thinking, oh, this will take care of him. And then I won't have to worry about him anymore. Uh, so his motive, so Heracles's motives for going off in, on those twelve labors were pretty specific. But then, uh, when it comes to those side adventures, like like the rest, wrestling with Antaeus, for example, um, yeah, it's it's very similar to Theseus because again, Theseus was largely modeled um, off of Heracles in in that respect, traveling along the roads and fighting the criminals who you know meet you who you run into and who try to kill you. So there's a certain element of self defense there too that would have been. Okay, uh, even in antiquity, um, and uh, so I don't. I don't know that Heracles. Uh, I mean, with Theseus, like we know, he intentionally set off on that road, having heard about some of these things and wanting to prove himself. So his motivation was, oh, just let them try to kill me. I'll kill them first. Uh, full of youthful confidence, but that turned out to be correct in his case. But Heracles was just minding his own business on the roads for the most part. He hadn't intentionally set out to uh, to meet all of those characters. He was just going from one labor to the other. And so if somebody was in his way and was trying to kill him, then you know he would obviously um, try to kill them first. So yeah. slightly different motivations and uh, uh, slightly different uh, mode, it, well, uh, slightly different circumstances of the encounters, I guess. Yeah, and and if it's, that, if and that it's helps. I think it does, and it, and it's uh, it's only coincidental, by the way. Anybody following along chronologically with these episodes, that just in the previous episode we had Hercules himself, Kevin Sorbo, on here, and he would <laughs> and he would have uh, he would be horrified now to find out in the very next episode I'm calling him a serial killer. Perhaps, <laughs> I think so. So oh yes, but see, I'm, I'm disagreeing about about that. Thing, about, about that thing. Yeah, yes. I, I think you would be happy that you defended him as the <laughs> shining beacon hero. I think. Um, so, but yeah, you're pointing out like in in Heracles' labors, you know, he is he's essentially he he was overcome by supernatural by divine forces to do the murders that he then is forced to atone for and there's some there's some kind of hint of fate there i think with the sphinx there's this there's this strange hint of of fate i think theseus in many ways was fated uh to uh, to be what he was and and i have to wonder you know i've i've come across this a, a little bit in real life i don't know much about serial killers to be honest but you know what i heard about say beating the btk guy is that yeah. he would um 
he he would consider himself kind of his victims fated or fate the god's meaning for him to do this where he would go and and check doors and if your door was locked you mm -hmm. that meant you weren't fated to die by his hand and if your door was unlocked then it was meant to be and and even in like movies like seven where we have the, mm -hmm. the kevin spacey serial killer is is driven by what he thinks is fate and 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 I don't really know what my question is for you there, other than does fate play a part in any of this? Oh, um, well, that's um, oh, that's that's a great question. By the way, that movie Seven is wow. I I I don't want to say I love that movie. I I I think it's a great movie. It's really creepy, um, and uh, the idea of like the seven de deadly sins being the basis for uh, the the serial killer felt justified in getting rid of these people. Um, so in terms of fate, well, uh, as, as you've noted, uh, in Greek myth, fate and predetermination is kind of a, a large element. For example, Oedipus being fated to marry, uh, to kill his father and marry his mother, and he tries to avoid that fate. And trying to avoid your fate never goes well in Greek myth. <laughs> um, although, you know, if you if you don't try to avoid it, it happens. If you try to avoid it, it happens. So which is, which is, which is preferable, showing hubris by trying to avoid your fate or or just like sitting back and saying, okay, I guess this is what's going to happen. It's horrible, but it's going to happen. So I'm not going to try to do anything about it. Uh, so, I mean, obviously within the stories themselves and for the reasons that they're being told, Theseus, for example, the Athenians were trying to, as, as I mentioned earlier, like sort of, they wanted their own sort of national Athenian hero. And so they were modeling Theseus after Heracles. And uh, so he, of course he was fated in the story to be told that his father was king of Athens. Well, actually this is one of those, oh, well, his father was sort of Poseidon. Um, Poseidon had impregnated his mother, but his like mortal father was the king of Athens. And so he was supposed to go and you know meet meet his father in Athens and later become king himself which he did which didn't actually go very well but he was clearly in the story fated to uh overcome all of these obstacles and uh sacrifice himself uh uh, as uh, or you know, offer to sacrifice himself as one of the uh, offerings to King Minos and to get stuck in the labyrinth and then hopefully kill the Minotaur, which he was able to do. Um, so, uh, so in the story is yes, there is like he's fated to become this great hero. And uh, Heracles is again this really odd, interesting case because that mass murder of his family was brought on by madness, you know, from from Hera, and those twelve labors are all an atonement for that. Uh, but too, because Zeus was his father. You know, some of these characters are fated for a certain kind of greatness, or at least for extraordinary adventure because of their ancestry. And even some of those criminals, as I mentioned, a lot of them had a, a deity for a father like Poseidon or Hephaestus, I think in the case of Periphetes. Um, so they were able to get away with what they did for a long time. It's just that the, you have the heroes whose motivations are noble and the criminals whose extraordinary abilities are channeled into, unfortunately, uh, killing and robbing and killing people. Yeah. Okay. So, and you know, I'm just now realizing that well, I feel like we've only begun to di to dig into these fascinating ideas and this kind of model of thinking. And already, I think I've kept you past the time that I promised <laughs> I, I would keep you. Oh, I um, actually so. don't remember what you had had said. So. Okay. Well, good. Then <laughs> you'll forgive me. <laughs> so, um, so we're. I know in your book, Monsters and Monarchs, you deal with serial killers, not only in classical myth, but a little bit in history, too. And so that's something we haven't touched on. Maybe you can just give us a glimpse of, of what of your thinking about uh, historical classical serial killers. Sure. Um, well, I think earlier I had mentioned that in at least a couple of cases, we've got some of what we might consider psychological background, or at least uh, some description of what these people were like growing up. And so it's in more, um, you know, I don't know if historical is, is historical sources is the right way to put it, but we have some um, written sources <laughs> that are non-mythological in nature that give us some background. And so there's one, there's one account and it is, it is a fictional story, but it seems to be based on real life uh, similar cases. So there's a fictional story. It's sort of a, it's a rhetorical exercise for law students. And it's an argument against, it's called against a murderer. 
And the murderer is described as a highway killer, like robs, robs his victims, but, but tortures them and kills them and mutilates their bodies, like chops them into bits and, uh, and then leaves them by the side of the highway or in some cases hides the bodies so that their families never find them and get to bury them. But the description of how he got to that point is one of the things I found so interesting. And this story was brought to my attention actually by one of my colleagues, uh, Craig Gibson at the University of Iowa, who was working on the rhetorical aspects of, of some of this, and he knew I was working on serial killers, so he, he mentioned it to me. So the background that's given for this person is, well, first of all, when they when they find out that he's accused of these murders and almost certainly committed them, uh, they say, oh my God, he seemed like such a nice guy, like, like, like the friendly neighbor who like behaves so well in public, but apparently he had this whole secret life that we didn't know about. And then you get to the description of, of how, how he reached that stage. And it's like, well, he, you know, he used to uh, start fires or behave violently and he got away with breaking and entering and he was never punished for all of these things. So no wonder he ended up, you know, being a serial mutilation murderer. Uh, Not that they used that terminology. But but the background that we're given for that character is so interesting, along with the comment that, but he seems such a, like such a nice guy. And then the other one that we have some interesting background for is the Emperor Nero himself, who, again, I'm not saying he was a serial killer, and we certainly have to take into consideration how biased the sources are. But we get this whole interesting description of his background, like absent father, distant mother. Um, nobody was really looking after him, so he would, you know, beat people up and he would uh, start bar fights and he would rape people. Um, And then, so it's no wonder he grew up and just didn't care about people's lives and would poison them or, you know, have them killed. It's a little unclear, you know, how many, if any people Nero might actually have killed himself. And again, the sources are so biased against Nero that we definitely want to take them with a grain of salt, but it's the description of, well, he started showing these patterns of behavior as he was growing up, sort of like Jeffrey Dahmer, you know, torturing animals and experimenting with with drugs and uh, just, you know, ending up to the point where, uh, you know, he would drill into people's skulls while they were still alive to to see if he could make them his his slaves somehow. And that's that's Jeffrey Dahmer again, not Nero. But (laughs) I I was just saying, you know, again, the descriptions of these the backstories of the people who ended up sort of being notorious for either killing a bunch of people or having them killed or plotting. Nero did uh, have a bunch of people poisoned, for example. So uh, I just found those backgrounds pretty interesting. It's uh, a, a very slight glimpse into what, you know, might be considered a psychological backstory for some of these characters. Yeah, that matches up uh, almost like point by point for, I think, what they look for when they're profiling the backgrounds, doesn't it? That's fascinating that it was happening that that early on. Uh, you know what? It just occurred to me one more I wanted to throw at you from classical sure. myth. Maybe we'll maybe we'll make this the uh, penultimate question, and then I have the ultimate question. That's the simplest <laughs> and the toughest for you. But it just okay. occurred to me: may, uh, Does Medea fit? I mean, she chops up her brother and throws him to the sea, mm-hmm. and then she has she uh, at least tricks uh, what's his name's daughters into chopping him up and mm-hmm. putting him in the cauldron, and then she kills her kids, and then she keeps trying to kill but she's just killing people all over the world <laughs> <laughs> well I'm, I'm gonna say yes i mean again that there's a sort of a uh there is sort of a pattern there. And I almost mentioned Medea when we were talking about Theseus because she tries to poison Theseus. Like that's pretty much the last thing she does before she disappears from mythology for good. Um, So yeah, so Medea, the princess of Colchis uh, who helped Jason gain the golden fleece. She was sort of like the the, the maiden helper of of folktale. And it just goes all wrong because she uh, is so in love with Jason, but uh, just wants what she wants. And so she has no qualms about chopping up her brother and throwing his body bits into the sea so that her father who is who is chasing her and Jason you know again by boat they're all in boats at this point her father stops to try to gather all the body parts of the brother his son uh, so that he can give them a proper burial so Medea and Jason get away and then when they get back to Greece and Jason is still trying to regain the throne there uh, Medea tricks the daughters of the usurper into chopping up their father and uh, and then when Jason 
and sort of throws her over and says, oh, yeah, you know, you're great. You did kind of help me and all. But look what I did for you. I brought you to Greece, the light of the rational light of the world. And by the way, I have to marry this other princess because she's higher status and you're a foreigner. So <laughs> Medea then, you know, sends this poor woman uh, a poisoned robe, like with acid or something that eats her skin and didn't destroy the actual cloth of the robe, but somehow, you know, eats into this woman's skin and sets her on fire. And then the poor fiance's father, um, who tries to save her also goes up in flames. And, uh, and then Medea kills her own children to spite Jason, uh, the, the children she'd had with Jason to, to spite Jason. And after that, she just sort of takes off, but she goes to Athens and she sort of like becomes the mistress of, of, of the king of Athens, who is Theseus's father. So when Theseus shows up and poses a threat to her influence over the king, she tries to poison him. Uh, and it doesn't work. I don't know if he accidentally spills the poison or whatever happens, he, he's fine. And then she, once, she's just, once it's discovered that she tried to poison him, she has to leave. And that, as I say, that's sort of the last that we hear of her. So she could certainly be considered a serial killer. Um, obviously, she she's killed everybody by slightly different methods. And there wasn't anything super secret about it because she got caught every time, um, but was able to elude punishment. But yes, absolutely. If we're looking for examples of women who kill multiple people over a period of time, she definitely you know fits into that mold. I think she's one of the cool ones who just gets away with it to the end. Like she I think totally she's a, gets away with it. <laughs> all yeah, you have to absolutely. do is jump in a chariot pulled by dragons and fly off yeah. into Mother um, Night, and you and you right. win. <laughs> I know, which is a flying chari uh, chariot, chariot uh, that flies in the air pulled by dragons. Yep. <laughs> So this has been this has been a fascinating conversation. I, I've really enjoyed it, and I maybe I can hit you with one last two part question. That's the simplest okay. of all, but perhaps you've been the asking some terrific difficult. questions. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. You've got terrific answers. So <laughs> I'm curious now. What monster scared you as a child? or the perhaps tougher one but and or what is your favorite monster of all time <laughs> that is a tough question you know, i've been asked it before and i never have a good answer i i kind of um in terms of being scared by monsters honestly i i don't think there ever really was one because you know, having heard about the Manson family murders when I was basically like, you know, five or six years old, that was scary enough. <laughs> and, uh, but I've yeah. always really liked ghost stories. Um, not because they scare me, because I, I just like how eerie they are and how speculative they are about, wouldn't it be nice if there was an afterlife, um, which I don't, I don't really believe in myself, but I just always enjoyed the atmosphere of ghost stories and some of the literary ghost stories, which is so spooky, but not outright terrifying, you know? Um, and then I suppose, I mean, there's H.P. Lovecraft um, and his sort of, you know, Cthulhu and the Elder Gods were always pretty darn creepy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I can't, you know, there was no monster from classical mythology that ever really, you know, struck me as terrifying. Um, I don't know if that's because there were just so many of them and they had such specific roles. And it was not like I ever thought any of them were hiding in my closet or under my bed. I was seriously <laughs> more worried about somebody breaking into the house and killing us, you know, in our sleep. Um, so, which is very unfortunate, of, of course, but, uh, but that was the sort of milieu, uh, you know, that was settling around Southern California at the time. Uh, what were those mass murders in the late sixties, I think. Um, so yeah, it was just a terrible thing to, uh, and you heard about them for years because of all the trials. And then we went to see a screening of, uh, what was it, Roman Polanski's movie, Tess, and they're right there up front to Sharon. Uh, yeah. So it was all just really like real life was so creepy. Who needed to be scared by mythological monsters? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, some people f fear that serial killers are breaking in their house and killing them. And while that's certainly possible, Southern California at that time, it was a roll of the dice. <laughs> it really was possible. You really did have monsters passing you on the street uh, that you saw later yeah. in the news. <laughs> there were just other weird things going on, like the Patty Hearst kidnapping case. I mean, there were just such sensationalistic stories going on when I was going, it was like the moon launch was kind of overshadowed by the whole Manson thing. It was incredible. Uh, so, yeah. That's um, so probably not the answer you were expecting, but yeah, it was just sort of from a very young age. It's like, oh, all these horrible things are going on in the real world. World. Those Manson murders were so horrific. Writing in blood on the wall, killing the you know pregnant woman, begging for her child's life. Yeah. Nobody had really, I mean, I don't know that anything like that had happened in, 
you know, in, in memory, you know, in, in modern memory at the time, like, yeah, at least yeah. not, you know, at least not where I was. I mean, I'm sure there were, you know, there were serial killers like obviously Jack the Ripper in England in the 1880s and then H.H. H. Holmes around the time of the Chicago World's Fair and uh, things like that going on here and there. But this was this wasn't even a serial killer. This was like a sort of an odd spree murder. Yeah, it was just yeah. so shocking because of the young girls who had no you know, remorse at all. Yeah, I don't know if I can't think of anything that was really that that captured the nation as much in the same way as the as the Manson stuff did, except maybe like the Lindbergh baby kidnapping. But that was that seemed more like of a ransom gone wrong kind of thing. So there was a murder, yeah. of course, but but not the set. You didn't see like the youth turned into well that that kind of zombie that it, that vampire or zombie like image, you know, with the X's and their foreheads and the core room yeah. and the manson family thing that's you know you're, you're seeing the monsters in real life just uh and in your case yeah. just down the road so exactly and the fact that uh manson could have that sort of influence and convince these these people to do that although i suppose we have a lot of uh modern day parallels that i won't even try to go into but yeah yeah it hasn't gotten a lot better since then i don't think so yeah, yeah. Um, but that that was really, you know, I think that just sort of had a, an impact on all of us at the time. Well, Debbie Felton, this has been fantastic conversation. I've really enjoyed it and I've learned a lot. And for listeners out there curious more about where they can find your books and where they can keep up with you and find out what you're up to next, uh, where should they look? Where should they go online or otherwise? Oh, gosh. Well, um, my books are all available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and all of that. I, I should just say that I don't I don't make a profit from these. It's like I get maybe seven cents from every book. I'm not going to get rich off of these books there. You know, um, it's it's not the, it's it's an academic press, even though the books are definitely geared for a broad audience of non-specialists. Um, but uh, they're, they're on Amazon. And uh, I, I don't maintain like a whole separate website. I basically, my only website is, is my, uh, the one at my job, my faculty page at the University of Massachusetts Amherst Classics Department. I'm just not quite organized enough to have my own separate blog or my own separate <laughs> website for any of this. Uh, my main job is teaching. And I do teach classes on mythology and folklore and um, ghost stories of the ancient world and so uh most of most of my time and energy goes towards teaching and just uh working in the summers i eventually you know produce the occasional book for a general audience about some of the really uh lesser known stuff that was going on in the ancient world yeah don't you even teach a, a whole class dedicated to witchcraft and magic in the greek and roman worlds is that true i do yeah, I do. And that's what it's called. I think it's called, which, uh, what is it? Magic. It, it has a new title now, Magic in the Ancient Mediterranean, because I realized it wasn't really just Greece and Rome that I was talking about because I bring in, there's a lot of stuff from the Near East, like, uh, you know, demon trap bowls uh, in Arab, in Aramaic and, and Hebrew and all that. So, yeah. And I, I mean, in fact, I'm, I'm certainly not the only person in the field who teaches courses on magic and witchcraft in the ancient world. Um, but it is, it is one of the ones that I, that I really like to teach at, at UMass. And uh, it's it's fun. it's definitely a lot of fun. <laughs> that is so cool. That is fascinating. So for uh, we'll have we'll have at least uh, links to your uh, to your faculty page in the description under below uh, in this episode. So if you're listening to this and you want to see those list of works that you can read more up on uh, what Debbie Felton has put together, then just look on whatever platform you're listening to this on in the description there's the link and if you're around umass you got to take those classes on magic and witchcraft in, <laughs> around the mediterranean i know i would if i were up in that direction so i'm offering it next year fantastic cool well again this has been a great conversation thank you so much for being so generous with your time and these awesome ideas and perhaps for freaking us out and making us have to worry <laughs> about serial killers as well as monsters both in the past and present but i think we all appreciate it uh if in the month of halloween if no other time i think so thank you so much again debbie felton Oh, Josh, thank you again for having me. It was a fun conversation. You asked some terrific questions. I really enjoyed uh, the, uh, the um, you know, ideas that, that we were tossing around. <laughs>